July 26th, 2019. The first Fire Emblem home console release in like 3,000 years. As a massive Fire Emblem fan who makes crazy Excel spreadsheets of the games I play, of course I was quite insanely hyped for this new entry, especially with the gimmick of every character having insane customizability. This is a game that boasts three different routes and stories to tell, though as it turns out on release there's actually four routes, and then five technically if you include the later added DLC side story as a route. I did my first playthrough with Black Eagle's Academy Route Hard Classic. It wasn't perfect, but definitely loved the game I'd say after beating it in just under a month. Did my second playthrough with Blue Lions Hard Classic, now with adequate knowledge of the game and took time to create insane builds for my units, and taking nearly double the game time of my first playthrough after about two and a half months. I still had a lot of fun and enjoyed the experience, but towards the end I began to feel a little of the burnout. Did the DLC three months later in Hard Classic, and after somehow making it through some of the most insane strategy gameplay of my life, I did actually really enjoy it, and it was different enough from the main game to keep it engaging. Two months pass, and I finally start my third playthrough. The pace at which I made it through the game continued to slow, taking more and more time between sessions and struggling to get the motivation to come back. After three months, of playing so little that I wasn't even halfway through the playthrough, I suddenly dropped the game. Six months passed before I finally picked up the game again to finish off my third and likely final playthrough, no longer any interest in doing the fourth route. But how did this really happen? How did somebody like me, who makes crazy Excel spreadsheets for Fire Emblem games I play, Someone who conquered all the 3DS titles on the hardest difficulty, including Awakening's Lunatic Plus Classic twice, which I would never recommend for your sanity by the way, somehow gets so fed up with Fire Emblem Switch release that I struggled to find the motivation to hop back into it, despite not even having seen the full story yet, and had to spend half a year of mental recuperation before I could keep playing again. Which was just intended to finish off my in-progress playthrough and not even do the final route I hadn't experienced yet. Fire Emblem Three Houses is a fantastic game in so many regards, but it has a lot of issues, most of which I wasn't even as aware of on the first, or even through a lot of the second playthrough. But after nearly 300 hours in the game, I definitely began to take issue with a lot of its aspects, which we will be covering today. So sit back, relax, and enjoy me rambling about all the problems plaguing what was probably my favorite game of 2019. The Fire Emblem series isn't exactly a stranger to the idea of branching storylines in multiple routes, with the most recent example of this being Fire Emblem Fates. With the release of Fire Emblem Three Houses, the multiple routes are definitely one of the main selling points and appeals of this game. With three, technically four, different routes to experience, Three Houses offers incredible replay value, right? Ask me during my first, or maybe even most of my second playthrough, and I would have said heck yeah! But now, I would say absolutely not. This is due to several reasons. To start things off, Fire Emblem Three Houses has a 5 year time skip that's supposed to be around the halfway point of the story, only that's not exactly the case. Pre time skip has 12 chapters, then post time skip Blue Lions and Golden Deer have 10 chapters, Black Eagle's Academy Route has 9, and Black Eagle's Empire Route has a measly 6 half the length of pre-time skip. No matter which route the player goes with, the pre-time skip will always be the majority of the game. Now, this wouldn't be a problem if the pre-time skip wasn't the exact same thing for every route except with different characters, which is also made worse by the game length. Older Fire Emblem games will typically just have you advance from story battle to story battle. Some other titles might have a map for you to traverse with side battles to do, such as Gaiden, Echoes, Sacred Stones, or Awakening. 
Others have other between-story battle activities such as Fates with a customizable castle. Several of these games also have paralogues for other little side plots, often resulting in character recruitment. Having things to do between story battles helps to prevent burnout and boredom from story battles by achieving a better balance for player engagement. It's good to have systems like this the player can partake in if they want to, but that should also kind of be the thing, if they want to. While other Fire Emblem games may have a couple things a player can do between battles if they want to, Three Houses has a lot of things for the player to do. Exploration. Unique fully voiced dialogue from every character on the map each month, including Gatekeeper. Quests. Greenhouse. Fishing. Sauna. Cooking. Meal sharing. Lost item returning. Faculty trading. Scrap heap searching. Gift giving. Tea chugging and awkward staring. Lore reading. Advice box responding. Saint statue restoring. Singing practice. Amiibo gazebo. Holy tomb. Yoinking students from other classes. Seminars. Paralogues. Misc enemy battles. Or even just rest actions that are probably the most useless thing in the entire game. And those are just the free days. Lesson days you need to assign goals to your students, give them some work, answer their questions, and foster some of their individual skills. Older Fire Emblem games with side activities typically have them as optional. If the player wants to rush from story mission to story mission, they can do so. But if they want to do some of these side activities, or even grind some levels and experience to prepare for story missions or create their favorite builds or whatnot, they're free to do so. They can do it as much as they like. In Three Houses, you need to do side activities. Well, I mean, you can technically rest or skip free days and auto-teach the lessons, but doing so basically means shooting yourself in the foot in hard or maddening mode. You see, in games like literally all three of the 3DS games, if you want to grind before a story mission, you can typically do so as much as you like. Take as much time as you need. Three Houses, however, operates on a calendar system. Every month you have a set amount of lessons and free days to spend making your team stronger before each story mission at the end of the month. If you want to grind, or in other words, do basically any side activity in the entire game, you've only got so many free days and activity points to do those in. If you choose to not use them properly, well, guess you're never making full use out of that free day, an opportunity to get stronger you've now lost for the rest of the playthrough. While Three Houses isn't exactly just a story mission to story mission, and probably has the biggest span of time between story missions in the Fire Emblem series if I had to guess, unlike several titles such as the 3DS games, Three Houses is a slow-moving, unstoppable train, always inching towards the next story mission, and therefore towards the end of the game. Once you make it to the next story mission, there's no backing out, no preparing with more than what you currently have. What this means, with some of the harder missions on the higher difficulties, is that it becomes possible to literally softlock the game. Meaning, you better be making the maximum use of your limited free days, or be keeping multiple save files of the same playthrough to unlock the ability to backtrack and get stronger the game doesn't give you if you want to have the least chance of getting permanently softlocked by being unable to beat a story mission, such as the first time skip mission on Madden Classic. For reference, in the footage used, yes I did beat it, after over an hour, and if I wasn't using a specific busted build I carried over from New Game Plus, I genuinely think I would have been softlocked here. So while previous games such as the 3DS titles let you go from story mission to story mission as you please and grind whenever you want, Three Houses gives you a bazillion side activities that make it so on difficulties such as maddening, if you're not spending at least an hour or two doing the same activities over and over again between story missions, then you risk screwing yourself and your save file over. Sure, you can still bum rush the story and avoid side activities like previous titles, but if you do so on hard or maddening, then you're probably going to softlock yourself. Previous Fire Emblem games like the 3DS titles have the story over here, and grinding and side activities over here, and it lays it out for you as the player in a way to say, you can do either of these to as much of an extent as you like at any time. You can grind for like 3 hours if you randomly want to right now before continuing with the story, or you could do the story for like 3 hours and then go do a little bit of grinding on the side. With Three Houses, however, it makes these timetables for you in the calendar and says, Here's grinding time, here's story time. Here's grinding time, here's story time. 
You can't save any of that grinding for later, or do any of the story early. Well, you can do the story early, but that means that that grinding time slot has now just been lost forever. You haven't made full use of it, and you're never going to be able to use it to make your character stronger. But at the end, what does all this mean? It means that Fire Emblem Three Houses is naturally going to become a very long game, with the majority of the game pre-time skip. It's essentially a 60 to 70 hour JRPG for anybody who takes their time with the game, which you get punished for not doing on the higher difficulties anyway, by following this preset timetable of grind, story, grind, story, grind, story. For an example of someone who takes a lot of time with a playthrough, my hard classic Blue Lions was my second playthrough, where I decided now I learned the game in my first playthrough, and was now ready to really perfect my builds. I spent roughly 50 hours pre-time skip, and roughly 40 hours post-time skip. In one playthrough I took my time with out of four total routes in the game, all of which need to be beaten to technically get the full story. As I mentioned at the beginning of this section, Fire Emblem games are no stranger in experimentation with multiple routes and stories. The most recent other example of this was Fire Emblem Fates, which, similar to Pokemon, released with two versions. Unlike Pokemon, which would only have incredibly minor story differences, and some differences in which Pokemon could be obtained to encourage trading, Fire Emblem Fates had completely different stories and gameplay styles. Birthright focused on more recent entries such as Awakening that was more friendly to beginner players, with more forgiving gameplay, ways in which to grind outside of DLC, plenty of supplies, and so on. Conquest, on the other hand, focused more on the styles of more classic Fire Emblem games, limited gold and supplies, no way to grind outside of DLC, which thank goodness it's an option there because I honestly don't think I could beat Lunatic Classic otherwise, and several stages that are so brutally hard and reset heavy on Lunatic difficulty that it begins to make you question the possibility of being able to conquer its difficulty without making sacrifices and drive yourself insane. I'm looking at you, Iago debuff staff stage. It's awesome, frankly. Both of these routes had different available characters, with a small handful that join you regardless of which route you choose, as well as unique classes for each side as well, with Birthright featuring Hashido characters and classes, and Conquest featuring Nor characters and classes, meaning your route also determines the type of units and playstyles you can use in your playthrough. For example, Hashido may have the Sniper, the class capable of achieving mastery with a bow and sniping enemies with extra crit rate, whereas in Nor, the closest equivalent is the Adventurer, which lacks much of the power of the Sniper but is also capable of healing allies. Each route has different playstyles and general gameplay format premises. It's honestly fascinating. No matter which game route the player purchased, they could purchase the other route as DLC at half price, in addition to the third route where you can recruit almost all the units of both sides, and close out the story in a, frankly, kinda unsatisfying way. This means that before any other DLC, Players would pay the price of two games in total for the experience of all three routes, which was one of the most controversial points of Fates, among other things we don't talk about. That aside, though Fates didn't exactly boast the best of stories unfortunately, its routes boasted enough gameplay differences to keep future playthroughs fresh and exciting enough to try out the different characters, classes, game styles, music, to stay engaging with seeing multiple playthroughs through to the end. The one positive difference in routes with three houses compared to Fates is that the player doesn't need to pay extra for any of the other routes, it's all part of the base game. In Fates, where the routes diverge is Chapter 6 after going from one story battle to another, so typically after about 1-3 to three hours. As well, whenever you start a new game after your first playthrough, you can actually start exactly at Chapter 6 with whatever progress you had by that point during your last playthrough, on the same difficulty or lower as last time so you can immediately start the route-exclusive content of the other routes, without needing to replay the first six chapters again. In Three Houses, where the routes diverge is after chapter 12, which can be anywhere from 20 to 50 hours into the game, except unlike Fates, you don't even choose which route you want at the place in the story where the routes diverge. You choose your route about an hour into the game, and then have to get through the same 20 to 50 hours you've done in previous playthroughs to get to the new content, with some very, 
very minor pre-time skip story changes with how your chosen characters interact with the story and each other. Well, maybe there are some other differences in Three Houses similar to the Routes of Fates. Does Three Houses have route-exclusive classes? Nope, not at all apart from the Lords each respective unique class. And I guess the Death Knight if you count DLC, even though it's just like, reskinned Dark Knight. Route exclusive story? Only really after about 20 to 50 hours. Different game formats or styles like Birthright and Conquest had with each other? Not at all, it basically feels like playing the same thing each time. Route exclusive music? Yes, technically. There's some different final boss themes, but that's about all that comes to mind. Unless you count things like, say, Black Eagle's Academy Route and Golden Deer both having like the Shambhala area remix in such a chapter that the two of them save that isn't in the other routes, in which case... I guess there's cases like that where some chapters exist in some routes but not others? Route-exclusive characters? Yes, but like 80% of them can be recruited into the other routes anyway, so there's usually only 1-3 to three characters that are truly exclusive to each route. Of course, it does push you to use the characters meant for each route and each one respectively, but all that really changes is the characters themselves and not really how you need to play. Fates had Hoshido and Nor classes based on which route you chose. Your route determines most of the classes and therefore play styles you have to work with throughout the adventure. In Three Houses, however, no matter which route you choose, you have the exact same pool of classes to choose from for every single route, and every house generally has units that fit into the same general distribution of classes anyway. So while the characters themselves change for each route, you're still basically playing the same thing with different faces each time. So if you want to experience the content that's actually exclusive to each route and get the full story, you need to play through almost the same 20 to 50 hours four times. I guess three if you save right before the Black Eagle splits into two routes before the time skip. 300 hours, and I've still only done three of the four routes. The third of which I haven't actually even finished at the time of recording this. And the majority of my time is in things I've now done three times. The biggest reason I struggled to have the motivation to continue with Three Houses was because I'm spending what feels like countless hours between story missions doing the exact same things I always do, and experiencing the same story I've seen three times. My six month break from my third playthrough happened during Chapter 10 of Playthrough 3, after a total of 226 episodes of Fire Emblem Three Houses on YouTube, averaging an hour each. Fire Emblem has always had restrictions on what niches a character could fit into. In several cases, characters would be set to only ever be able to fit one playstyle. As time went on, more options opened up, such as Awakening, where you can reclass that character's available class sets whenever their level is high enough, or pass parent class sets and skills down to child units. So, for example, you could have Krom pursue his Canon Greatlord class, or if you feel like putting a bow in his hand with Bow Knight in order to never have to deal with one of the most bullshit enemy skills I've ever seen in any game ever, Counter, then you can do that. Fates took the customizability a step further, with no more gender-locked classes, which they threw the idea of out the window once DLC rolled around, and new seals such as Marriage and Buddy Seals that unlocks the primary class sets of a unit's S support and A plus support partner respectively. Three Houses seemingly promised to be the most customizable game yet, with you as a professor teaching a group of students who all start at level 1. You can have every character in your army focus on skills of your choosing, develop their skills and work towards the classes you see fit for them. You can surely customize your characters however you like, only the game rewards you for developing them a certain way, and punishes you for developing them another way. You see, each character has assets and flaws, where assets are where they'll gain more points in, and flaws where they gain less. Three Houses kind of marketed the idea of, do you focus on their strengths and make them specialists, or do you make them all-rounders by developing what they struggle in, 
But these things you develop are their proficiencies with weapons and additional attributes such as skill in riding, flying, armor, and authority. It's not like you're having them focus on particular stats they excel or struggle in, like how hard they hit or how much damage they take. All you're developing is what weapons they're best at, what classes they can go into, and to a lesser extent, what skills they can learn. What this means is there is virtually no benefit to developing an all-rounder type of character instead of just focusing on the weapons and attributes the character excels at. Because unless you're going for certain skills, there is no reason to develop things that that character won't be using anyway. And has no reason to be using when the thing that they're better at suits them off better anyway. So yes, you can customize your characters, but you shoot yourself in the foot by not customizing everybody in a very specific way. As well, when it comes to classes, everybody has access to every class in the game. Well, almost. Gender-locked classes make a return. Every character can go into literally any class in the entire game, except for a specific few, determined by no other fact than their gender, which also affects what class mastery skills they can obtain. So for example, male units can never learn Darting Blow, and female units can never learn Quick Repost or Reposte or however it's pronounced. So the entire range of classes and skills isn't even truly available to every unit, for no other reason than their gender. Or for another class, the Dark Mage classes. You can only enter these classes using a Dark Seal. How do you get Dark Seals? You get one every time you defeat the Death Knight, who's pretty much always a crazy difficult optional boss in the limited story chapters he appears in. This means you only get a limited amount of Dark Seals in a playthrough, the amount of which is determined by how many times you take out an optional boss who only appears a set few times throughout the entire plot, a further limit to customizability. One really neat idea of this game is any character can now use any weapon regardless of class. You'll still typically be better in some particular weapon types or gain more skill points in it, but you can give people any other weapon types for them to fall back on, like giving a unit a bow for a ranged alternative. Any class can wield any weapon, except for magic. Well, and gauntlets for any mounted unit, but that doesn't make logical sense anyway for having a mounted character punching, and would break the game in half considering how busted gauntlets are in this game. But magic is literally only usable by the magic-specific classes. You can't be a thief who also flings spells. You need to be a mage or other magic class. It seems so strange to me that anybody can wield literally any weapon but if you change into anything that aren't like mage garbs, you suddenly forget what the hell magic even is. So any character can technically factor in almost any weapon, but only mage classes can factor in magic. Another feature of Three Houses is budding talents. Some units start out not so good in one specific attribute or weapon type, but if you train it enough, it becomes a budding talent so that character now excels in it and unlocks an exclusive skill or combat art. But not every character even has a budding talent, only some of them. And there's some really good budding talents out there, such as Felix and Edelgard who can use black magic crit plus 10. But not every character has a budding talent. Not every character has a crest, which has to do with the story. Some characters have both a budding talent and a crest. Some have neither. And some characters have literally pointless budding talents. Take Edelgard, for example. Black Magic Crit plus 10 is like one of the snazziest skills out there, and she's one of only three people in the game who can get it if you include DLC. Makes sense that she gets something crazy as one of the main characters of the game, and who's been canonically shown to use magic. The thing is, her exclusive classes can't even use magic. Or take Constance, for example. She has a budding talent of brawling, something that her canon final class of Darkflyer literally can't even use. For both these cases, just why? Why even give characters something really spicy that you can't even use unless you divert them away from their intended paths, which again, Three Houses very much punishes you for doing. Another interesting thing Three Houses adds is Hero's Relics, which may be weapons or accessories. These will always have some sort of strong effect or stat increase, but they will also always have an extra effect, 
only when used by a unit with a matching crest. For example, any unit can get the defensive stats from the Aegis Shield, but only Felix gets the added benefit of a chance to have any damage. Or any mage can equip Thursis for an extra 2 magic range, but only Lorenz or Lysithia can benefit from the chance to have damage received, similar to the Aegis Shield. Much the same, unique weapons will have a unique combat art that only the crest holder can use. So while you can customize your relics around by giving them to virtually anyone, you only reap the full benefits of each by giving them to one or two specific characters. At the end of the day, the best characters are still going to be the ones with the best growth rates, best personal skill, best crests and budding talents that not even everyone has, best hero relic affinity, best gender that suits their build path which I would argue most often is female for darting blow. It's far from the anybody can be anything and be made to be an asset in your army in their own way that Three Houses is meant to embody. Games are a very unique task we as humans choose to partake in, since at the end of the day it's putting in work that one typically wouldn't be that interested in doing. Take Animal Crossing for example. People typically don't like doing work and chores, but when you have a game about doing exactly that while hopelessly in debt to a capitalist raccoon, it's suddenly fun and the second highest selling Switch game? This isn't magic or some strange coincidence, there's reason behind this. One of the key ways that games incite the player to continue playing their game is through what's called meaningful decisions or choices. A meaningful choice is one that both requires the player's consideration and has consequences the player cares about. In Fire Emblem, this could be the perfect tile to move your units to, what steps you can take to get out of a bad position, and it feels good to figure out the solution to some absolutely insane map. I'm looking at you Ashen Wolves maps. In Animal Crossing, meaningful choices could be, hmm, do I want to buy that house upgrade for more space but go into debt again? Do I want to give this gift to my favorite villagers so they like me more? Do I want to give this one insane fish I caught to blathers, or do I just want to display it in my home because it's cool as heck? It may seem simple in comparison to something like working out the solution to insane maps in something like Fire Emblem, but it still has that addictive quality of making decisions the player needs to carefully consider the benefits and consequences of as they make decisions they care about throughout their adventure. However, it's important in game design when aiming for meaningful choices to avoid accidentally creating meaningless choices. A decision can be meaningless for several reasons. If a choice is obvious, then there's no real actual decision to be made. An example of this could be buying properties in the early game of Monopoly. Would you like to buy the property? Yes, of course I'd like to buy the property. There's literally no benefit to me not doing so. Not to say that every decision in every game has to be meaningful, there's still plenty of meaningful decisions in Monopoly, I'm just using it as an example that there's no real choice in this specific situation. Or if a video game gives you the option between a really strong or really weak weapon, then there's not really a decision, is there? If a choice is hollow, this means that there's no real consequences. In Animal Crossing, this may be buying a house upgrade. There's no interest on the loan, so there's no difference between getting the upgrade now or later, so may as well get it now if you want to essentially max out your house. In The Walking Dead, if you choose to save one person over someone else, the person you save is probably going to die the next episode anyway. It could also be hollow because there's no choice at all, such as the Blue Lions route where the game asks you if you want to go to Enbar or Ferdiad, but then it just makes the decision for you either way, and your decision has no meaning or consequences. Most people who got to this decision probably googled the consequences of each. We like to know what consequences come of our decisions, but if there are none, it becomes a hollow, meaningless decision. If a choice is uninformed, then the consequences appear to be arbitrary. Here, the player has a choice with real consequences, but there's nothing for them to really consider or a way to know about these consequences. Undertale is a great example of a game that signals to you how your decisions have consequences, becoming informed decisions. A completely new player with no background knowledge would typically wind up killing Toriel assuming she would have just been defeated or some such, and then witness her dying and soul shattering. She's now gone for the rest of the game. Even if the player restarts the game to undo that decision, Flowey tells the player how they restarted the game to save her. The whole sequence is an insane slap in the face of 
Your decisions have serious meaning. What happens is all consequences of your actions, and is a brilliant example of showing decision consequences over telling. This entire intro sequence serves to make the rest of Undertale's choices inform decisions. An example of uninformed decisions could be three houses with choosing a house at the beginning of the game. Like, you know what students you'd be leading with each choice, but you know like nothing about them or their personalities. You've talked to them at most once by now on a first playthrough. You know nothing about how they'll develop as characters, all you know about how they'll develop as playable characters is their assets and flaws, of which each house is basically the same-ish general distribution anyway. You don't know how the stories will change with each route, and so on. This becomes an uninformed decision, because even though it's clear this decision will have consequences, you as the player honestly know next to nothing about what the consequences of this decision are. It has consequences, but you as the player haven't been given adequate time to consider them. It's not like Fates where it gives you the decision after several chapters of getting to know the characters and background of each side. And finally, a choice is meaningless if it's a hidden choice. It's a choice that happens with real consequences, but the player never even realizes that they made that choice. In the Three Houses, the choice of which side to take during the war is hidden behind the choice of which house to lead. You as the player never make the decision of which side in the three-way war aligns with your own morals and perspective, and you would like to go experience a story of. This choice is set in stone for you the moment you choose a house to lead. Fire Emblem Three Houses has a lot of meaningless choices, but what I want to return to on the subject of customizability is obvious choices, which I would like to compare to Fates. When it comes to strategy games like Fire Emblem with multiple units, there should be things that set everybody apart from one another, which for Fates and Three Houses are things like growth rates and personal skills. Unlike Three Houses, Fates also has a limit on which classes a unit can go into, and therefore which skills they can obtain. Each unit has two class sets, but they can obtain one more through their S support partner, and one more through their A plus support partner. S support partner also determines the stats and available skills of any resulting child units. So oftentimes S support partner for the children having units is based around what makes the best stats, classes, and available skills to complement my plans for the child unit, and A plus support partner is more based around is there a class I can unlock for this character from this A plus support that works really well on this character and I'd like their final class to be, or are there some really good skills from this class that I can use the A plus support to unlock for this unit or to pass down to the child unit. Every unit can only have one S support partner and one A plus support partner in a playthrough, and usually A plus is only available with a handful of units. This creates meaningful choices that allow the player's strategic creativity to flow. Yes, there's a limit on which classes and skills every character can get, but half are assigned to the game as what the character starts with, and the other half are available through the player's careful consideration and choices. You can keep the characters in their canon classes and they'll still be good. Or you can have a look at the numbers like growth rates and personal skills to really determine what a character might be best in. For example, look at Saizo, who's typically supposed to be a physical damage ninja type unit canonically. He's got a 50% growth rate in strength, but also a 45% growth rate in magic surprisingly, while also having a 45% growth rate in defense and a 10% growth rate in resistance. What this means is you could throw him into, say, a physical and magic mixed class to complement his great strength and magic growths, and hopefully put a little band-aid on his measly resistance so he has less chances of getting shredded by mages. Maybe then it becomes worthwhile to give him an a support partner who gives him some physical magic mixed classes to tinker around with, and maybe a magic-based S-support partner to create an insane physical magic mixed child unit from the two of them. In Fire Emblem Fates, it's not like anybody can just access any class or skill. Choices are limited, and that's what helps make these choices meaningful. The player can carefully consider their limited choices of S and A plus supports, and how they want to use it to shape their units in question. Maybe if I A plus this person, I get a class I'd really like for this character. But if I A plus this person, I can instead get access to the Vantage and Astra skills. Even if a player just wants to go with the default canonical kind of stuff for every character, they're still typically going to be pretty good characters, and have enough diversity in your army for everyone to have their own dedicated niches or roles. 
But if a player really wants to push their unit's potential, or even just experiment with some crazy builds and ideas after looking at the numbers like with the Saizo example, they can do so, and their creativity is rewarded with creating these crazy builds that one would never expect in a casual playthrough, but wind up working out great. This is one of the ways in which Fire Emblem Fates has customizability incredibly tailored to suit both casual and hardcore players through its meaningful decisions. In Three Houses, however, Outside of gender-locked classes, anybody can go into literally anything if you develop their skills enough. There's no route-exclusive classes, you can't do anything like recruit people from other houses to have access to their unique classes, or maybe reach A-plus supports with specific units from your house to unlock some of those class sets on them. There's no way for characters to share classes or skills, everybody just has access to everything that their gender and training lets them obtain. Everybody just has access to almost everything. So, that means you can look at things like growth rates and learnable magic and make some crazy unexpected builds, right? Well, this would more often be the case if it wasn't for assets and flaws. The game gives you access to everything, but then tells you, if you put your character into this thing, they'll develop faster. Put them into this thing, and they'll develop way slower. The game basically tells you, want a good unit? Put them in this class. Want a shit unit? Put them in almost anything other than that specific class. There's a decision here, but it's a meaningless decision because there's no reason to make the bad choice. I would argue the only meaningful decision in Three Houses in regards to character customization is who to create a dancer. You might ask me, why isn't who to give Dark Mage classes to a meaningful decision? And this is for two reasons. The easier reason is there's just no master classes available through it anyway, so by the end you'll probably just be in a stronger class at the end of the day. The two Dark Mage classes are therefore only useful to actually use in battle around the mid game, and only long term consequences in the end game is the skills Poison Strike and Life Taker, which to be fair aren't bad skills. However, using a Dark Seal on a unit is a meaningless choice because it is uninformed, the player doesn't understand the consequences. With the Dancer class, the consequences are that only one unit can become the Dancer. You've got to choose one character to keep the class exclusively for the rest of the game. The player can understand these consequences, and use them as a basis to make an informed decision on who to give the special class to. However, in the case of using a Dark Seal, the player knows they can only get one each time they defeat the Death Knight. So, when's the next time they're going to fight the Death Knight? The game gives you no answer. How many more times are we going to face the Death Knight? How many more Dark Seals can I get? The game gives you no answer. As the player, you know that there is a limit on Dark Seals, but you have zero indication what the hell that limit actually is. So if you use a Dark Seal on one of your units, it might be 10 more gameplay hours before you can get another one, maybe it'll be 20, or maybe it's impossible to get any more because you're never going to see the Death Knight again. There's no way to know. And this all comes with the assumption that you can actually defeat the Death Knight when, or if, you see him again. He's not exactly anywhere near as easy to beat as any other enemy on the map. So whenever you use a Dark Seal, you can't know the consequences of when or if you're ever going to get any more Dark Seals again, making this a meaningless, uninformed decision. One could argue there's a decision about developing certain weapon skills to go into certain classes for certain skills to make custom builds, as I did non-stop in my 100 hour blue lion save, but all this decision is, is do you want to take a bunch of extra time in other classes or spend tens of hours in things like class maxing machines just to make your units a bit better or get some spicy builds? A benefit that only serves to help you beat the story. There's no post game or harder challenges to tackle other than the story, making the decision to grind past the strength you need to beat the game meaningless. Fire Emblem Three Houses preaches customizability, but then punishes the player for not taking the exact path in customizability that the game wants. One of the things I really looked forward to in Three Houses was the ability to have my own vision come to life for the characters around me, not work towards the game's vision for everyone which is created far from equal. One of the reasons I got burnt out of Three Houses is because I was tired of the hand-holding, pushing me towards developing all my characters in a certain very specific way, and being punished if I don't. Combine that with the fact that, again, 
Each playthrough features the exact same first 20 to 50 hours each time, only to get 10 to 30 hours of new content you haven't seen yet afterwards. All in all, it just becomes very difficult for me to get the motivation to come back and experience the rest of what Three Houses has to offer. Having a look at the 3DS Fire Emblem games, between battle, two of them have an overworld map, and one has a customizable castle. You can go around this overworld doing paralogues, side battles, or even doing DLC maps as many times as you like. Echoes had a difficult post-game dungeon you could grind for. Awakening had apotheosis that your party better be as close to perfected for you to handle. And Fates with Conquest had, well, its final two maps. If the player wants to take the time to really flush out their builds and improve their party, there is a reason and benefit for doing this. Maps are challenges that become much easier, or possible in the first place in the case of Apotheosis. There have also been some light multiplayer elements, such as Street Pass teams with Awakening. Build up the best team of 10 you can and show off your strength and hard work to friends and stranger passersby. Or Fates, which did have a multiplayer versus feature. Try to conquer your friends' castles against them. It feels good to make your characters stronger, customize them with builds, bring them closer to the cap of their power. And if you want to keep working on a save file after beating the game, you can do exactly that. I can look at something like my nearly 100 hour awakening save file for this channel and be like, hey, that's my best save file, where I've made the most builds, and it's always going to be there waiting for me if I ever want to go back and do more. In Three Houses, however, after a file has reached the end of the story, that file is done for forever. Any additional maps available in Three Houses are just the paralogues littered throughout the story, which you need to spend your battle points during free days to do. With Three Houses calendar system, no matter what you do, anytime you do anything, it brings you closer to the next story chapter. Anytime you do a story chapter, it brings you closer to the end of the game. Once you make it to the final chapter, that's it. You can no longer do anything on that save file, and have a strong chance of softlocking the game depending on where you save. So, my second playthrough, my Blue Lion save, I was finally ready to pursue making the best builds I possibly could like the crazy Fire Emblem nerd I am. I began spending as much time as the game let me take to make my units as strong as possible, master as many classes as possible to flush out their possible builds, and even discovered and implemented something I like to call class maxing machines. I took nearly as much time with this file as I could, and probably have over a hundred hours in this one save file. After I finally beat the final boss, the game prompted me to save before the credits, which I figured, at worst, would just place me before the final boss again. It didn't. Anytime I load that file, it just plays the credits now. My 100 hour save file, of countless grinding, has been rendered null and void. It may as well have been deleted. In games like the 3DS titles, before or after the final boss, I could spend as much time as I want in, say, DLC maps, becoming as strong as I want, or tackling as many other challenges with my builds as I want. These are save files I get to keep, and later on use my hard work to tackle whatever challenge I feel like doing from what's available. I can feel good about my progress and hard work, and look at my save file with pride. In Three Houses, best case scenario, you save before the final battle, and not afterwards when the game prompts you so you can at least replay the final map. But unlike these other games, once you're locked into the final battle, you can never go back to get some more levels first, unlock some more skills, do some more lessons, or even interact more with the characters that you've grown to love throughout the story. You only have so many free days and lessons throughout the entire story, and once you're out, you're out forever. And no matter how much hard work you put in throughout the story to get to your current strength, by the end, the game just Thanos snaps it all away with either a soft lock by prompting you to save before the credits, or leaving the save file in a state where all you can ever do with it ever again is replay the final battle at whatever your current strength is. With the limit of free days and lessons throughout the story, this game is essentially an experience where the player slowly inches towards losing all their work, and the only benefit to becoming stronger is beating the story. That's it. To have put nearly 100 hours into a save file, only to have it softlocked before the credits and inaccessible forever, I'm not gonna lie, it feels like shit. 
So then on my third playthrough, tackling Maddening Classic, I never grinded anywhere nearly as much as my Hard Classic Blue Lines playthrough, because why would I? It's all eventually going to be trashed anyway. There's no reason for me to do anything more than the grinding necessary to beat the game, and that's all I aim to do. You can create crazy builds and skill combinations for characters, but how am I supposed to find the motivation to do so when I'm armed with the knowledge that three houses reward for hard work is just taking it all away by the end? Oh, but you can use Renown to buy progress from previous saves down the chain of New Game Plus files. Yes, you can, but this is an inherently flawed system. Each playthrough only gives so many quests to earn Renown. With DLC, you can sell items for Renown and vice versa, but items and gold to buy items are never unlimited, meaning Renown is always a limited resource that you can't exactly just grind for as much as you want. The amount of Renown you have at the end of a file carries over to the next New Game Plus file you make. So yes, you can spend Renown to make yourself stronger in the current file, but every time you do so means you're now carrying less Renown into the next file. If you spend Renown on, say, weapon skill level, well then maybe the save file you can develop it even further and then it's possible to carry this further ability over to the next file. For class mastery skills, however, and basically everything else, redeem those in your current file, and in your next file, that comes with the added benefit of nothing. You still have to use Renown to repurchase the class mastery skills and basically everything else that you've already purchased with Renown before in further playthroughs. So while you can spend Renown to acquire some of your strength from previous playthroughs, if you want to have as strong of a New Game Plus save file as you can, Every time you spend Renown, you shoot yourself in the foot by taking away from the available pool of Renown for future playthroughs. Three Houses has a bad habit of punishing hard work by taking it away, which made me really struggle to find my motivation to keep playing. Why would I put in the effort if it's just going to be taken away? Fire Emblem Three Houses is, frankly, a fascinating game. Games don't need to exist within the confines and history of our own world to share ideas and arguments about our world. Three Houses to me was like experiencing how many ideas and arguments about the world can we cram into one fictional game, and it's honestly fascinating. One could write essays on the morality of Edelgard, the demons of Dimitri, the power of the Church of Seros, the influence of the nobility and crest holders, and what it means to choose a side, among so much else. Fire Emblem Fates had the two sides at war, which you could choose a side with either side, but also had a third route where you could save everyone and find peace between both sides. A Three Houses, on the other hand, has no option where everybody is saved, no truly completely happy ending. It makes the argument that in this kind of conflict, there isn't some solution where everything can just work out without sacrifices and sorrow of some kind along the way. There is no correct path. No matter what route you choose, you're not in the wrong, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're in the right either. The best anyone can do is stick true to their vision and do what they can to see it come to fruition, despite the hardships along the way. This is a very fascinating stance to take, however, it's held back from its full potential due to the nature of the routes. You as the player never choose what side to take in the looming war ahead, you just follow along your chosen lord. The game never asks you to choose a side akin to your own views and image on the world. This choice is automatically set in stone for you when you make the decision for which edgy teens you want to teach warfare to at Jesus Camp. The game makes the argument that no side is truly morally right, 
but a lot of that argument loses its meaning when the player's ability to make their own choice is essentially stripped away by locking it in with a completely different choice, completely unrelated to the player's views on the eventual conflict at hand. One of the biggest appeals of Three Houses is the multiple routes, being able to experience different sides of the conflict for this game to express that no side is truly in the right. But after you do one playthrough and experience one side, you need to sit through 20 to 50 hours of virtually the same over first half to start really seeing another side firsthand, and then do it two more times after that. As well, the Black Eagles route is held back from its full potential, largely as consequence of its splitting into the Empire and Academy routes. Edelgard was the most flagship cover protagonist of the game during marketing, and her story winds up being the shortest by a significant margin. Apparently, Blue Lines was intended to have a later route split as well, making 5 routes excluding DLC, but it was scrapped before release. I feel like if the focus had been on these 3 routes, and the player's ability to find their own place within them, rather than telling all sorts of branching paths while taking the player on a crazy uncontrollable ride that they can't dictate, both gameplay and customizability wise, the game would have been way better off. The name of the game is Three Houses after all, it should have been embraced as such, rather than working on things like an academy route split off of Black Eagles, or other routes split in Blue Lines, which served to hold back some of these stories from their full potential had they been the prime focus. So how would I change things? The Three Houses experience in general. First of all, I would do away with choosing a house at the beginning of the game. Instead of you becoming the professor of one of the houses while Manuela and Hanneman become professors of the other two, you're all, all three houses professors, each presumably teaching the students different things. Each month's story mission, you can bring in a mix of whoever you like from the cast of students across the three houses. Of course, you'd be able to take far from everybody, which is why the story excuse could be that Manuela and Hanneman take the students on separate missions themselves as you do story missions, and afterwards, the students you didn't use gain some experience as well so they don't lag far enough behind that they become unusable. While most story missions would have a customizable cast, there could be a story mission where you're specifically assigned to take a particular house, such as the Blue Lions being assigned to take down Sylvain's older brother as it's viewed as a Blue Lions matter, for example. Have at least one mission exclusive to each house in pre-time skip, and a paralogue or two, and with that mission have cutscenes before or after as an opportunity to express some deeper parts about that house and how they interact with each other. As well, the mission itself in gameplay can be a nice change of pace and way to expose the player to some specific playstyles and team setups. Have some cutscenes here and there throughout the pre-time skip about the three lords that would normally only be expressed in their routes in the current system, such as Edelgard discussing her past, or Dimitri talking to you about his demons and revenge. The Battle of the Eagle and Lion could have you choose whichever house you want to side with, without any obligation to be locked into committing to them for the rest of the game or anything. It's like the first question the house leaders ask you in the game of which house you prefer, which has no dictation on which one you actually have to choose later. Have pre-time skip in total be maybe a couple chapters shorter, because holy heck is it long. Have the player play up past the time skip without making their choice of which route to do. Because Chapter 12 of defending Garrick Mach against Edelgard would be strange if you went on to join her later, have Byleth and their students instead defend against a separate assault from those who slither in the dark, when Byleth is suddenly knocked down into a ravine and sleeps for five years. After waking up and making their way to Garrick Mach, Byleth meets up with some of their fellow staff, who fills them in on the situation and events of the past five years. Characters like Sedith could fill in Byleth on each of the three lords' current statuses and standpoints in the ongoing conflict, and with Rhea gone, authority would largely go to Byleth, and it could be asked what course of action they would take from here. Here is where the player could make their choice of where to go, along with a recommendation to save in a different slot beforehand, but also like Fates, have this moment be a hidden save in the game's memory, so that any time the player wants to start a new route from where it splits, they can load this hidden save. This choice would now be made after an extensive pre-time skip that shows the player that each of these forces has their own convictions, beliefs, goals, and morals that they can understand part of by this point, unlike the current three houses where you only get character backstory of the lord you choose at the beginning of the game. 
With an adequate knowledge of each of these lords and what they are fighting for, the player can choose if they want to help Dimitri overcome his demons and restore the kingdom, if they want to help Claude keep his old classmates in check and help bring peace to Fodlin, or if they want to dissolve this faction of the Church of Saros to assist Edelgard in creating a revolutionized world with the old systems done away with. This would then be a decision based on the player's own convictions, morals, or even favorite characters based off of the entire first half of the game up to this point to build up to this decision, rather than having their moral choices be dictated by a decision one hour in of which group of students they'd like to teach and inadvertently change the rest of the story, past 20 to 50 hours in at least. As well, for gameplay, do away with assets and flaws. Characters could still have differences in growth rates, personal skills, crests, budding talents, and learnable magic. One of my favorite parts about Fire Emblem Fates was that every character had their own unique skill, their own unique class sets, and their own unique supports for things like A plus supports for the buddy seals, so I can look at this and strategize and consider, hey, who should I get them to A plus support with to get another class set? What skills come with this class set? What complements their personal skill and current class sets the best? My options are way more limited in Fates than something like Three Houses, but it's open enough that I can make educated decisions after enough pondering and Excel spreadsheet putting together to make builds that suit my own playstyle. Unlike Three Houses, which currently has the system of anybody can go into any class outside of gender-exclusive ones, but we're going to essentially force you to put them down one or two specific routes and that's it. As well, more students who don't have crests should have budding talents, give them at least something nice to their name. Make sure that anybody who has a budding talent has something they can actually use, instead of being impossible to use like with Edelgard and Constance, without severely nerfing them by taking them down an unintended line just to use their unique talent. I would have any class able to wield magic instead of just mage-like classes. As well, have more diverse classes than what we got. What we got was just like, here's a mix of pretty standard Fire Emblem stuff. Have some more spicy weapon combination focused roles, along with many house specific classes so that each route also has different playstyles and kits available. Wait, I also don't mean to imply that the exclusive house classes wouldn't be available in pre time skip. Maybe I should reiterate by saying that any character from a specific house would be able to go into that house's unique classes, whether it be pre time skip or post time skip. Also, no gender locked classes because that's stupid. Any future playthroughs can start at the decision of which region to side with in the war and experience the exclusive story and classes right off the bat instead of needing to redo the 20 to 50 hour pre time skip. I'd also have the monastery be available at any time, like a hub of sorts like the My Castle of Fire Emblem Fates, and chances to grind being unlimited. However, I would have the grinding map's levels be based off of where the player currently is in the story, similar to the EXP grinding map of Fire Emblem Fates where the enemies were tougher the further the player was in the story. What this means is even though grinding is technically unlimited, the player can usually, at best, use it to gain maybe a couple levels, balance out their party a bit for those who they feel need it, and gain some weapon experience. To further make it so that there can't just be a situation like Fire Emblem Awakening where the moment you get access to grinding you can just max out everybody, I would also have a Bisa in the grinding maps you would start gaining way less weapon experience once it got past a certain point and you weren't far enough in the story. Like if you're only one or two chapters in, maybe you can't get skills past D+, without them gaining one or two skill points per battle. Lessons would be possible between every say one to two battles, so it's not spammable, but still technically usable on limited times before any story mission if the player chooses to. Same 1-2 to two battle deal with the greenhouse so the player can't just spam obtain unlimited food items to build up student motivation, actually needing to do some work for it. I would also have a pre-time skip level cap, as that would be before the big choice in my proposed system. Maybe level 30 or something like that, with master classes only available after the time skip. So then after the time skip, characters could finally surpass this level cap and finally enter master classes. As well, be sure to keep in mind that level 30 is a much higher level than people would realistically be by the time that the time skip rolls around. I say level 30 with keeping in mind that the player could grind unlimitedly. Is that a word? As well, I'd also have a pre time skip skill cap for each of the things teachable in the classroom, maybe say A rank or something like that. The reason for this level and skill cap is because without it, 
there'd be crazy people like me who'd feel motivated to max everybody out before the branching paths. So anytime I started a new file from the split and routes, I'd never have to redo that work again. I'd have, in essence, a perfect route split file to call back on. Having a level and skill cap before the route split would make people like me be like, alright, it's not possible to grind for a perfect pre-time skip file with max stats, so I won't. I'll just go up to the pre-time skip level and skill cap for everyone, which shouldn't be like super, super hard. I'm not kidding when I say I'm that kind of crazy. In Fire Emblem Fates before the branching paths in chapter 6, I literally spent a level just spam singing with Azura until I got her to the level cap of 30, so anytime I started from the branching paths, I already had Azura nearly as strong as she was possible to be by that point. There should be side battles or DLC maps akin to the 3DS Fire Emblem games the player can do at any time. Have some really challenging ones that could be worth making crazy party builds to conquer such as Apotheosis, except not as crazy because Apotheosis is stupid. I as the player could then look at these maps, and then look at my main three save files and be like, hmm, what would I like to tackle this with? Or who haven't I conquered this map with yet? The exclusive characters and classes of Black Eagles, Blue Lions, or Golden Deer. I could develop these save files I actually get to keep, and work towards flushing out to tackle any challenge ahead, instead of having my progress limited and hard work taken away by the end. Fire Emblem Three Houses is still a fantastic game, which makes some very fascinating arguments. It contains a grand full picture, but expects players to replay the same majority of the game over and over in an incredibly long JRPG, where skipping ahead to story sections is punished with the potential of softlocking. Three Houses promises customizability, but punishes players for not following its predetermined vision for each character. Three Houses preaches that no side is truly in the right, but it then takes away the player's ability to willingly choose their own moral stance in the conflict ahead. There is a fantastic game hidden under there, but there's too much of a struggle to get to it. Expectations for engagement are too high. I have 300 hours and still don't know the full story. Exactly how long do they expect an average player to put in? Fire Emblem Three Houses is an example of a great game that's held far back from its full potential due to several factors in both its gameplay and formatting. If we got a Three Houses with the format and changes I described, I could easily see Three Houses being my favorite Fire Emblem game of all time. But instead, I have a game that I struggle to pick up and play for my channel anymore, and it feels like work rather than playing a game. A game I couldn't bring myself to pick up again mid-playthrough until half a year of recuperation. There is an amazing world filled with countless fascinating arguments hidden under there, but it's how much is required to painfully dig through to reach it that holds Three Houses back from its full potential. And that's actually where I was planning on wrapping up the video, but instead, let's pull a Fire Emblem Three Houses and say, surprise, there's actually one more route. One more bonus chapter to our little story just tacked on. I think it's due time we talk about maddening. Fire Emblem has never exactly been a shining example of games with a difficulty setting just the right level of difficult for those seeking a challenge. Take for example Fire Emblem Awakening's hardest difficulty, Lunatic Plus Classic. Rather than determining a great combination of enemy strength and skills to really push the strategic ability of the player, the developers just gave all the enemies a pool of insane skills typically way stronger versions of what the player can obtain. How these skills are distributed among the enemy is almost completely RNG and decided when the map is generated. Too many enemies with Luna Plus? Reset. One particular troublesome enemy has counter? Reset. Early on, almost any unit will get 1 to 2 shot, exception being Frederick, your free promoted mounted armor unit. He'll probably be 3 shot instead with the Luna Plus, though sometimes still 2 shot. By chapter 2, if your avatar doesn't have defense stats rivaling Frederick's, you basically cannot beat this chapter. So in the earlier chapters, even if you beat them without casualties, you still need to reset if you didn't get good enough RNG on your defense level ups. Conquering Lunatic Plus Classic has almost nothing to do with a player's strategic ability. What it truly tests is a player's patience. 
The following game of Fire Emblem Fates did away with Lunatic Plus, and while I would argue Birthright Lunatic was too easy, and Conquest Lunatic was a bit unfair, though not as much as Awakening, it does very much seem like Fates was at least a much closer step to finding that sweet spot, a very challenging without being unfair. Then with Echoes, even Lunatic was done away with, leaving just normal and hard, with hard in my opinion feeling like how I'd imagine normal difficulty should feel. This game didn't really feel like it had a challenging difficulty per se. Then we come to Fire Emblem Three Houses. This game initially launched with just normal and hard mode, with a new mode which would be added later being in the works. As of yet, I've never actually played on normal mode, and I played Hard Classic for my first two playthroughs. Hard felt pretty standard most of the time. It was mildly challenging, but wasn't really the kind of thing that felt like it was really pushing my strategic limits. There were definitely a couple paralogues during the playthroughs that really cranked things up, and I had to just sit there and think about what moves I should make for a good while, and come out of the mission feeling, wow, I'm really glad I conquered that, that was pretty insane. But this only happened maybe two or three times, the rest of the maps pretty much felt like if you called this normal mode, there would be no issue. But then after my first two playthroughs came the release of Maddening Mode, which seemingly promised to be the challenge that fans of strategy RPGs were looking for with Three Houses, which I plan on hopping into with Golden Deer. Well, how was Maddening for me? Fire Emblem- Oh, you're doubling me! Oh, you're doubling me! It didn't say in the freaking prediction beforehand that you double me. Why are you doubling me now? No! All right, we're gonna go after those flyers next turn. What the heck is this bull crap? What is this crap? Ah. If you freaking double clawed, I'm gonna be so mad. What? Please miss. Heal over and die. What the heck is this bullshittery? Oh, come on. What is this? What the heck? And they attack on the same turn they come out now. My units down below are gonna die. Oh, come on. Well, let's see if this works. I missed. Well, I've pulled literally everybody into this freaking line here of hopefully safety. I hope. You what? It's not safety. Like, his crit rate's gotta be absurd right now, right? He has pass! Let's hope that the ones at the bottom don't spawn. Yeah, that one still spawns. It does block them! It you does fool. indeed block where the- What?! No! I am so bad! Okay, please work. Please work. Everything is banking on this. Everything is really bank on this. I really don't want to be soft locked here. Okay. He only has a 69% chance to hit. I don't know what these hit rates are, but we. He lived! What the? No, missed. What is this freak? How did he live? Did... What an experience and a half this was. Enemies' stats are cranked up to a thousand, meaning they hit like trucks, and very seldom are you going to have one of your units be able to take out an enemy in one turn on their own. Now in Fire Emblem, your speed stat needs to be so much higher than an enemy's in order to attack them twice in the same attack action, and vice versa. At least within the games I've played of the 3DS titled and most of the Game Boy Advance games, as well as Hard Mode of Three Houses, Typically, the only units who weren't going to be doubling enemies were my units whose niche was to just be tankier, or had kind of bad speed growths, and even then, I'd still see them occasionally double anyway. As well, I'd rarely have enemies double me, maybe only sometimes really rarely against a dedicated tank unit. In Three Houses Maddening, the early game starts out with enemies being able to double you and you only really being able to pull off single attacks on them. But then as we get several chapters in until around the mid-game slash time skip, speed works as one would roughly expect from Fire Emblem, with any one of your units with decent speed double attacking enemies a lot of the time. But then post time skip, the stat steroids injected into the enemies go into overdrive and keep on doing so more and more until the end of the game. In three houses, if a unit in combat has four greater attack speed than their opponent, they will double attack. 
So while a lot of my units would have an average speed of maybe, say, 25-ish, my slower units like Balthus or Hilda would have around 18-ish, and my really fast units like Byleth, Claude, and Leone would be in the early 30s of speed, and that was usually after using stat-boosting items on them. Enemies, meanwhile, would have like 37 speed. Basically, almost every one of my units would almost always get double attacked. Sometimes very rarely one of my fast ones could avoid getting doubled. In Fire Emblem games I've played, usually the least useful stat has been luck. If I see that increase on level up, it's like, eh, whatever. I guess it does something, but I don't really care about it too much. I'll barely notice it. And this was the case in hard mode of Three Houses as well. But in Maddening, one of the most important stats in the Fire Emblem series, Speed, became the new most useless stat in the game for like 90% of my cast. If I see Speed increase on level up on any one of my units who averaged around 25 speed at this point in the game, it literally did not matter. It's not like I have any chance of getting remotely close to the 37 speed my enemies have. The only character's speed mattered on was my fastest units, who, with really good RNG for speed level ups and the right stat boosters, could maybe avoid getting doubled every time they get attacked, but still usually not. Within the late game of Maddening in Three Houses, speed became a useless stat, and I just had to accept that, with the exception to enemy armor knights, every enemy was always going to double attack each of my units, and my units could only ever double with gauntlets or brave weapons, never mind being able to attack four times with those weapons like they're typically used for. What this meant was my units were seldom able to take out an enemy on their own, I usually needed to use two ally units to take down one enemy unit, or use gambits purely to stop multiple enemies from moving the next turn, because I straight up didn't have enough resources to deal with them all on this turn. And you can't leave any enemy alive with movement remotely adjacent to your main forces, as they'll always double attack kill somebody who can't take the hits. So if you can't get away from certain enemies or form a strong enough wall, you need to either figure out how to deal with it this turn, or gambit some to deal with them next turn. This whole issue with speed is honestly kind of fascinating, and in a way was a neat way to have me rethink Fire Emblem strategy when all the enemies are double attacking me instead of the other way around. Cranking enemy speed up to 1000 wouldn't be so much of an issue in this difficulty if it wasn't for hit rates. For some reason, in deciding how to make their strategy RPG harder, the developers just decided they'd give the player worse RNG, largely through hit rates. It makes the game harder in a way that's out of the hands of the player. But if I'm trying to land a gambit that has like a 10% chance to hit, so I move that unit close to 4 others for a 4 person gambit boost, and the gambit now has like a 45% chance to hit, then that's not me failing to strategize. That's the game saying, screw you, win this gamble or potentially lose the map. Gambits in Maddening hit for so little damage so much of the time, and have hit rates so insanely bad that even if you position yourself closer to allies to increase the odds of hitting, you'll still be more likely to miss in countless situations. And it's not just Gambits, general hit rates for player controlled units have been quite decently nerfed as well. So when you combine the aspect of enemies having crazy inflated stats like speed, and your own units having garbage hit rates, especially on gambits, then it's like these two things which on their own have the potential to be challenging but fair gameplay, suddenly combine to make gameplay that becomes unfair. So many situations I found myself in where I had the exact number of units I needed in an area to deal with all the enemies nearby, either using two of my units to take out each one of an enemy unit, or using gambits with others to deal with them on future turns. I'd be able to do it if, and only if, all my intended attacks and gambits landed. And when I'm dealing with subpar hit rates, and gambit hit rates that are often more likely to miss than hit, then that's not me losing because of a lack of strategy, that's losing to bad RNG. 
In Fire Emblem Awakening's hardest difficulty, the RNG you dealt with was mostly the pool of BS skills enemies were assigned at random. In Three Houses, you can at least know each enemy stays the same with every attempt, but it's now whether you can even hit them with what you need to or not that's called into question. Combine enemy inflated stats with garbage hit rates along with an increased number of enemies, and you've got a system where I counted myself lucky if I could so much as survive a turn without any care how much damage I did to the enemy forces. But then comes another part of what helps make Fire Emblem games just the most fun, balanced, and fair strategy RPGs ever. Random ambush spawns. One of my favorite things in Fire Emblem is being able to look at the whole map, check the enemy's stats, weapons, numbers, and so on, and choose my party and inventories accordingly if I need to change things up and play around with what I'm dealing with. Random ambush spawns is the equivalent of saying, here's something you had literally zero indication would happen out of nowhere here to ruin your day. Now, having some unexpected elements within strategy games on its own is not necessarily a bad thing. It creates a new problem the player suddenly has to adjust their strategy to play around. How do I get my units into positions to deal with this new issue? But the thing about how insanely jacked up enemies are in Maddening, most of the time there's a random ambush spawns near some of your forces, they're almost certainly going to kill somebody on the same turn they spawn. If you're playing on Classic, and then this isn't a situation you just adapt to and play around now, it's something you need to completely undo to save the life of the person who died, either using Divine Pulse, or resetting the whole map if that's what it comes down to. Using Divine Pulse or map resetting should happen because you misplayed, not because the developers were like, hey, let's slap on random ambush spawns with zero indication they're coming just to appear out of nowhere and kill units on the same turn they spawn. So the player then wastes their valuable divine pulses and time with having to redo things over again now that they know about the random ambush spawns the map preview screen doesn't show you, and even then, there's no guarantee you'll be able to escape your unfair fate. Maddening is the mode where you can pull insanely thought out spicy strategies over and over, and still somehow get royally screwed over. I don't think Maddening is as much of a test of patience over strategy as Lunatic Plus from Awakening, but it is still rather absurd. All in all, Maddening mode throws the general principles we've used in other modes, such as the speed stat, out the window, which would be a very fascinating new way to strategize around this game, if it wasn't for the fact that one miss with the now garbage hit rates can mean a divine pulse or reset. Enemies are beefed up so much that sometimes your best just isn't enough. Main bosses can Thanos snap most of your units. Random unexpected BS skills ruin your day. There's so many enemies on the map that sometimes it's just not within your capabilities to deal with them all, and random ambush spawns continue to throw player strategy out the window. Combine all these, and you have a system where, as we've discussed in this video, you ideally want to take as much time doing several hours of the same activities grinding between story missions to reduce your chance of being softlocked as much as you can, which in the end continues to make Three Houses a longer and longer experience of the same stories you've at least experienced parts of multiple times. To go off script and just talk for a little while, Fire Emblem Three Houses really is a great game in so many respects. I wouldn't have over 300 hours in this game if it wasn't a great game. But there's just so many things about it that when I hop into it just make me feel miserable for having to experience that it just becomes a bit of a slog. Even though I just finished complaining about Maddening, there was a lot about the difficulty that I found really intriguing and a lot of maps that I could conquer and feel great about myself for conquering those, without the same level of unfairness as Fire Emblem Awakening, usually. But it's just such a slog to get to these maps that I actually enjoy, because of all the activities that I just have to do over and over and over again to reduce my chances of being softlocked as much as I can. Like, I love the monastery. I love being able to walk around the monastery and talk with all these characters. I love being able to share tea with the various characters of this story, 
take a break after all the stressful battles and just sit down and enjoy some character interactions, you know? I loved being able to go to the advice box and read what students were writing to me and answer their questions and such. I loved being able to go into lessons and foster students individually in the things that I want to see them develop in, and watch to such a fine detail how they grow. I think back fondly on games like Fire Emblem Fates and how I could just explore around my castle and do various activities around it, to however much of an extent as I wanted between battles, and just kick back and enjoy some moments with some of the characters that are building up the story. But in Fire Emblem Three Houses, as enjoyable as these various activities could be, I was forced into a situation where I had to do them because there was a limit on activity points, and any activity point that I didn't make full use of was an activity point that I'm never getting back again to make full use of in the future. Sharing meals with my students didn't feel like a nice break to just enjoy character interactions, it felt like just getting their motivation back up so that I could make full use of lessons again. Having tea with characters stopped feeling like the relaxing thing that it should be, because it just became a tool that I had to make use of to boost our stats. Or let's say for example that you have a favorite character who you're going to S support at the end of your playthrough and you just want to like sit back and relax and enjoy some character interactions with them. Every time you go to sit down and enjoy tea with them, uses up one of the limited times that you can do that before the end of the playthrough and your save file becomes useless. The problem with three houses is you're forced into doing too much of everything, and that too much of everything is also finite per save file, so you feel obligated to do as much of it as you can. Like by the end of a save file, if I save before the final boss or before the credits, guess I can never go back to the monastery and enjoy some of these character interactions and side activities ever again in that save file. That save is basically done for. It was so nice in the 3DS games just to be able to pick it up be like, okay, this is where I left off, let's maybe develop some of this a little bit, maybe develop some of that a little bit, go do some of these side maps that I remember being enjoyable, and then maybe close up my 3DS and put it down again. But with three houses, when you're done with a file, that file's just done. Like, you could save in the monastery with full activity points for some save just to continuously reload to experience those activity points over and over again, but it's not like you're making continued progress in that save file. Like in something like Fates, if I went back into the save file and did some more side activities, I'd still be making progress within that save file, because it's a save file that I get to keep. But in Three Houses, your activity points are finite. If you want them to be infinite, you could just keep on reloading saves, but then you're not making any progress, and it's like, okay, why am I even bothering to do these side activities then? Fire Emblem Three Houses is a great game at the end of the day, I'm just really, really tired of putting so, so, so much time into a file and then having it taken away. Regardless, I do still absolutely think it's a worthwhile game to strategy RPG enthusiasts. And heck, even if you've never played a Fire Emblem game before, I'd still recommend checking it out, it's still a great game. I genuinely think that the best experience with Fire Emblem Three Houses is doing one, maybe two routes and then just looking up the others on, say, YouTube or something. I don't really think it's worth it to do all four routes, doing the exact same 20 to 50 hour first half four times, and then a roughly 10 to 40 hour different second half, but different could be said loosely because there's a lot of overlap between the different routes regardless. Is Three Houses a worthwhile game to play and get into? Absolutely. Just don't feel obligated to do all four routes in four different playthroughs. It's absolutely a fantastic game, but it's just riddled with a lot of issues that really hold it back from its full potential. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. This has been a massive undertaking of a project that I've been working on on and off for like two months now. I still feel a little bit strange though, knowing that not everything is wrapped up considering my 276 episode series on Fire Emblem Three Houses is three of the four routes. Maybe I'll eventually just push through the last route on normal casual just to get it done with so I can feel better about myself and feel like this whole story is properly wrapped up. But for now, I'm gonna be taking a step away from this game for a good while. I feel like Three Houses, especially if you want to do multiple routes, is one of those games that you do need to take a decent step away from from time to time. With that, I hope you enjoyed the video. I'm gonna go pass out now. I'm kinda tired of editing this project. Bet you can't catch a bigger one of the same kind.
Oh yeah, Caspar. I'll bet you mine is bigger than yours. Right. Let's see what you got. <laughs> Let's see what you got. I, I lost. <laughs> How? Uh, I guess I underestimated you. <laughs> That's so much funnier when you take it out of context the way that I did. Oh my god, I didn't think it was gonna be that funny. I'm seriously <laughs> underestimating, Professor. Oh my goodness. Yeah, we we got his axe. Oh my goodness. Jealous because mine's bigger than yours, Caspar. I seriously underestimated you, Professor. <laughs>